going to be speaking to Yuvon Wakefield, who's the CEO of Caveat Legal. Yo, lawyers, even the name itself is a legal term. Yuvon, good evening to you. <laughs> good evening, Kaya. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Now, Yuvon, the legal field can be very complicated. And if you go to Twitter, it even get, gets even more complicated. But back to the normal field. I mean, over the years, I suppose one of those professions that has probably stayed true to the practices of old, where people wear very strange things when they go to court, where you can't speak to attorneys and advocates that you have to refer each other, very complex. And as the world evolves, I begin to wonder, has the legal profession kept up? That it's such a good question, and you know it's exactly why we're here. You know, in the past, as you've pointed out, uh, the legal industry was designed by lawyers and propped up by lawyers. Lawyers decided how legal services would be delivered, at what price levels, on what terms, and for some reason, the legal industry didn't seem to consider itself to be subject to market forces or obliged to listen to its customers. So, you know, other sectors need to be responsive to their markets, but somehow the legal industry didn't think it needed to do the same. Um, until recently, companies needing legal work or commercial legal work would need to brief a traditional law firm, consult with the lawyers at their offices, pay the rates prescribed by the lawyers, um, and wait for the time that it took to deliver the work. But on our investigation some 10 years ago, we actually observed that the market for commercial legal services wanted something different. It actually wanted good quality legal services provided quickly and without fuss and fanfare and at a reasonable cost. So to us, the obvious way to achieve this was to build a platform business model like an Airbnb or an Uber that simply connects specialist lawyers with businesses without any bulk fanfare or cost associated with the, the, the traditional firms. So we did this by putting together a virtual legal consultancy um, and we've seen exponential growth. And so what we've done to get to your first point was we've basically just gone back to basics. We've simplified the whole thing. We've removed as much complexity as we could. And it looks like the market is happy with this. Yvonne, if I was your lawyer, I'd be angry right now because the way you've presented it sounds like it's something you've done recently and people would think you did it in response to COVID. But you actually had the presence of mind to look at this almost a decade ago to say, well, this thing has to evolve. And that's when you started putting together Caveat Legal. Yeah, exactly. You know, I'm, uh, I am probably qualified oof, almost 20 years ago. And, you know, I became a lawyer because I wanted to be able to help people. Um, and then I, I got into traditional practice and, you know, somehow... It wasn't really about helping people. All of a sudden, we were chasing fee targets and, you know, it, we, we were in management meetings and training meetings and all types of things. And so so for me, quite a long time ago, it became clear that we kind of lost the plot a little bit and that things could be changed and, and done in a, in a completely different way. So I started Caveat 10 years ago. Um, and it's so interesting, you know, going into COVID where everyone was moving online. You know, we've been online. We've been virtual from day one. So we didn't have to make a single change to our operations when COVID hit. Um, and in fact, we saw our best year ever. We saw revenue growth of, of 65% in the last financial year, which, um, which you know, is, is absolutely off the charts and fantastic. Mm. Now, Yvonne, that one of the traditional practices, that referral system, which I must confess, I absolutely do not understand. I mean, I've got friends who are advocates, and then as soon as I say there's a problem, they're like, no, don't talk to us, talk to someone else. It makes absolutely no sense to me. Is it something that was historically just structured as a, as a legal <laughs> process in that you couldn't do it any other way? Are we seeing maybe a change towards saying, well, why add this additional cost to a person who wants act to access legal services and force them to pay two practitioners instead of one? What, what are the changes there? Yes, actually, our, our um, regulators have done a very good job. Our legisl- legislators and our regulators have done a very good job at removing some of those barriers. So now you actually don't need to um, brief an attorney who then briefs an advocate for you. You can brief an advocate directly. Um, and, and many attorneys do have the right of appearance in court, so they can actually represent you in court without an advocate. Um, of course, all of these things were done to try and make the legal the legal industry more accessible to the public. Where we fit in is, is actually not on the litigation side. It's more on the, on the commercial side. So all of our clients are are kind of businesses that are doing deals, big transactions. Most of our clients are are investors, so private equity businesses or or venture capitalists who are doing deals and are needing commercial legal services. Um, And that's where we saw that we could actually make a big difference by providing an alternative to the traditional law firm model um, for those types of clients. 
Some people have commented that the one industry that seems to have been thriving in the past decade or so is the legal industry. Some of the fanciest buildings we see in Santin are indeed attributed to law firms. What drives the demand? Is it a question of the conflicts that need to be resolved or just the complexities associated with doing business in the modern day world? You know, I think it is the complexity. With each year that passes, new laws are passed. Um, you know, it, it, co- the compliance burden on businesses out there is just massive. And so, you know, w- with each year that passes, things do become more complex. And unfortunately, companies are needing to use lawyers to help them to understand, you know, what the law means and how it, how it um, applies to their businesses. So I think that's the, that's the, the main reason. A very interesting one, because I suppose if you look at the history of the modern day violation of the profession, the Legal Practice Act, is it something that was widely seen as the game changer that enabled or facilitated easier access for people like me to get legal services? Is it fit for purpose? You know, we're yet to see. Um, I think some of the changes have been very good changes. We're yet to kind of see the, the benefit actually trickle down to the consumer. Um, unfortunately, you know, many of the big traditional law firms have stayed exactly the way that they are. As you mentioned, they're kind of brick and mortar operations operating out of huge, big, uh, lavish buildings that, that actually aren't strictly necessary to the provision of good legal services. Um, so that's one of the, the big overheads that we thought was completely unnecessary and would just do away with. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see now how, how things go, but we certainly think that the market is responding well. I think, you know, we, we still have a long way to go to make legal services, you know, much more acceptable, uh, accessible and, and easy for the consumer, whether the consumer is a business or a, or a lay person to use. But, you know, one step at a time. But yes, I think the, the, the regulator is doing well and, and, you know, I think the Legal Practice Act is definitely a step in the right direction. The role of technology seems to be embraced in every profession except the legal one because if I want to sue you, there is a need for me to go and say to a sheriff, please go and knock and until you see her face, do not come back so that you can prove that she's been served. How are we in really just getting to the step where even the legal practitioners are going to have to deal with the fact that maybe technology is unavoidable rather than trying to resist it? Absolutely. I mean, it's it's been it's been interesting running a, a platform business that's completely virtual with lawyers many of whom consider themselves to be, and I'm, I'm doing air quotes here, you know, not good at technology. Um, it, it needs a mindset change from the lawyers. But having said that, COVID has actually been fantastic. You know, you've had so many court appearances and hearings actually conducted completely online for the first time. Um, you've got serving and filing of legal documents happening online for the first time. So certainly there have been some improvements. And I think the younger generations, as they come into the profession, are definitely much more open to it and, and beating that change. It's the kind of, it's, it's the guys sitting at the top of, of the food chain that are, that are less easy to change. But, you know, the change is definitely happening. Now, obviously, Yvonne, there will be some risks, and I suppose the correct term may be legal risks associated with that move to technology because suddenly if somebody can generate a document on their computer, send it to you, you think it comes from me, and suddenly many years later on I say, I never did that, I definitely never touched this document, then we all find ourselves in a bind. How are we responding to the need to still ensure the integrity of some of the more legally binding documents, some of the critical ones, and also not be hamstrung by the question of, oops, where is the sheriff? You know, technology is, you know, yes, there are risks associated with technology, but my argument is that actually there are fewer risks associated with technology than there are in just human error. People make mistakes. And the reason why all law firms and so do we have so much insurance is because people make mistakes. It turns out that that machines actually don't make as many mistakes. So I do think that the move is is a good one. Um, but, you know, we have to keep looking at risk, whether it's te- technological risk or human error, and we need to make sure that we provide for that risk so that our clients are protected. And, and any, you know, any law firm, you know, ourselves included, you know, have to look at this very carefully and make sure that we're operating in the most responsible way possible. And, you know, one of the interesting things, of course, is that in the world of technology, it is still possible for me to Google my way through a particular set of parameters and probably find something that is close enough to the type of document that you'll be putting for me as a lawyer. Are you seeing a lot more people saying that, look, if all I need is a basic lease contract, I'll definitely find something online. If I need a prenup, I might find something online. I probably wouldn't recommend it for prenups. But are you seeing a lot of uh, clients saying that, actually, I don't have to pay you in order to do this. Somebody's already done it, and all I have to do is change this and that. Definitely. There's a a lot of use, you know, particularly by SMEs, early-stage entrepreneurs, 
you know, people who, who who don't have a lot of funds to spend on this kind of thing, you know, are copying and pasting, but, you know, from templates, getting templates online, borrowing from friends, those kinds of things. It's definitely happening. It comes with, with a huge amount of risk, but sometimes it's better than nothing. Um, you know, we always obviously would, you know, advise that, that lawyers look at these things because the job of a lawyer is to ask the what ifs. You know, what if things go wrong? What if, what if you know, this party doesn't perform in terms of their obligations, those types of things? So, you know, we'd always recommend that, you know, lawyers actually apply their minds. But having said that, you know, the online contract generation tools are getting better and better every year. Um, we, we're not quite at the stage where we trust them enough to use them for, you know, across the board. But they really are improving so quickly that I think soon we're going to get to a stage where re- it's going to be really easy to get, you know, documents that are 90% good enough um, online, you know, in a way that's sort of commoditized and, and is much, much cheaper and, and more accessible to the population. Speaking of that, Yvonne, what on earth are smart contracts? Smart contracts, you know, I don't actually like the word because they use the word contract, but mm. the, the, the word contract in the, in the context of smart contract is, is actually more just a transaction, okay? It's a small, you know, if this happens, then this must happen. Uh, a contract in, in the way that we usually refer to it ourselves is, is many, many, many terms like that that are all inter, interwoven into a, into a kind of bigger transaction. Smart contracts are little transactions that are encoded into typically a blockchain type technology. Uh, Ethereum seems to be the blockchain technology that is the most amenable to smart contracts. But having said that, I have suspicions that even Ethereum uh, for smart contracts actually can't handle the level of bespokeness, if that's the word, um, that many, even simple legal contracts need. So we're watching that space very closely. It's hugely exciting, but it's still nascent, and we're still trying to see how much um, smart contracts can actually hold um, and manage within the confines of, of the blockchain technology. You know, Yvonne, when we speak about, you know, having to evolve and adapt, I imagine that many of the big uh, law firms that we see in Sentin, for example, those buildings have to be paid for, which means that the fees that get ultimately charged to the client are probably incorporating the cost of delivering the service, the traditional cost of delivering the service. Over the past year, I suppose even those hardliners who insisted that that's the only way it could be done have been forced to acknowledge that there are different, more innovative, and I suspect even much cheaper ways of actually delivering legal services. Exactly. And, you know, I haven't seen any one of the large firms actually, you know, once it became apparent that all of their lawyers were working from home, um, actually allowed their clients to enjoy some of the cost benefit of the lawyers not having to sit in the office. Obviously, the clients carried on having to pay the fees that they were paying before for the big buildings that were sitting empty. So it's been a very, very interesting time for us to watch how things go. But for all intents and purposes, the the big incumbents um, are happily going along. They have slowed down their hiring and those types of things. Um, But they're still, you know, happily going along. And, you know, it's interesting. I think the market also has has become alive to the fact that actually, you know, maybe they don't need all of that bulk and fanfare when they need their legal work done. They just need a smart lawyer to sit and do the work, turn it around quickly, you know, and, and get the job done. And I think, you know, that realization has probably come at, you know, as a bit of a grudge conversation for a lot of the traditionalists. But obviously, it's the times that we live in. One other interesting dimension of how the legal sector has probably historically positioned itself is this issue of our own conflicts of interest. I once read a very horrifying story about some person who said, well, actually, they wanted some legal services. I think it was in the conveyancing field. And then they discovered that the bank that with whom they had a dispute had literally engaged every other person that they could possibly talk to within the sector. Everyone said, oh, no, we got conflict of interest. And it turned out it simply meant that you couldn't actually access services because the market has been structured in such a way that meant that if the bank could find a way of signing a contract with every lawyer in the market, there are no lawyers left for us to access. Are you seeing maybe a change in some of those practices? Because I imagine they don't make it easy for people to access legal services. Exactly, Kai, that's such a good point. It's it's not one that that comes up a lot with us, but, you know, know, the banks do it, the big telco companies do it. You know, they just make sure that they've engaged all the big firms um, on some or other little matters so that the big firms are conflicted out of any uh, matter that would come against them. You know, this whole, the whole thing of conflicts of interest is so interesting because, 
you know, lawyers kind of pride themselves as, you know, being very um, aware of conflict and not allowing conflicts and that kind of thing. Um, and something that's always been a bugbear of mine is that even within normal traditional legal practice, you have a conflict of interest that rises in front of you. And that is where your traditional firms place fee targets on their lawyers. So the way that that works is if you're an attorney working at a, at a traditional law firm, every month you have to bill a certain number of hours um, and, and bring in a certain amount of money to your firm in order to be retained and promoted. So your performance is, is actually um, monitored and evaluated against how much time you bill and how much money you bring in for, for, the, um, for the firm. But that then means that you're incentivized not to find very quick, easy solutions for your clients. It sometimes means that you're actually incentivized to make mountains out of molehills and, and make briefs bigger than they need to be and make more work than needs to happen. Um, of course, many, many lawyers don't work this way, but some lawyers, when they're under pressure, will, will work more on matters than they need to. Um, and so their interests are actually misaligned from their client's interests. And you've got an actual conflict of interest right there. You know, the clients are needing the work turned around quickly, cost effectively, they're needing solutions you know, without any fuss, um, and the lawyers are wanting big briefs that go on forever and ever and ever, and they can carry on billing on. So that's a conflict that's also, you know, right there, um, but it seems to happen, you know, across traditional legal practice, not only in South Africa, but also across the world. Is this perhaps a reflection of a sector that probably at some point in time forgot that it must exist to serve the interests of its clients rather than the question of what its fee targets are? Exactly. So I think, you know, lawyers, you know, in the old days, lawyers were kind of, seen as, as almost as artists, you know, they were kind of revered and they were specialists and they were, you know, they would do things on their own terms. Um, they never saw themselves as service providers. It's only in today's world um, where we are starting to force the change and say, well, look, you know, we're not actually better than anyone else. We're service providers. What do our customers want? How do they want to procure these services? And how can we make the whole experience easier for them? So, yes, we're seeing that change um, and it's a very, very interesting space to watch. You've been blazing the trail for 10 years in showing people how the sector can actually still deliver services in a bit of a different way. Have you received some calls in the past year or two to say, hey, hold on, advise us on how to stretch our operations? Yes, absolutely. And, you know, we, we're so keen to encourage competition in the space that any new players that come in um, doing something similar to us, we reach out to them straight away. We tell them what we've learned. We, we kind of make friends, you know, straight away so that we can, you know, all keep an eye on each other and make sure we're all doing what we're doing in the most responsible way possible. Because actually, the more competition there is in the space, the better it is for the consumer at the end of the day. That, you know, competition and choice for the consumer is what means, you know, that the system is actually operating very healthily um, and it, it supports the whole economy. So, yes, definitely. Yeah, and I imagine yeah, being the trailblazer does come with, obviously, that sense of clout in the market out there. Yvonne, where are we are in 2021, give me three interesting things that you see emerging in that sector that reforms and repurposes the sector so that it becomes more responsive to the needs of its customers. What does the legal profession look like in 2030? Whew. Okay, so in 2030, I think we are still going to see traditional players uh, big, big traditional firms. I think they're going to be um, slightly smaller than they are now. They're going to be uh, more focused on bespoke work. Uh, the next thing that you're going to see coming in is just the vast availability of commoditized, machine-generated contracts that are maybe not the best, but good enough for most businesses' needs. Um, and unfortunately, thirdly, I think you're going to see an industry that's actually, because of the, the tech side coming in and the commoditization of a lot of legal work, you're going to see an industry that becomes smaller and smaller and unfortunately has less opportunity um, for lawyers that want to, to follow the, the traditional route. But of course, where there are changes, there's always opportunity for people with fresh thinking and people who come in wanting to make things better. Yeah, I suppose we all have to adapt. You had a good year as Wakefield, 65% growth in revenue. What are the prospects for 2021 slash 2022? We, yeah, you know, we're going for it. You know, thankfully, the, the, the model has proved itself to be completely robust now over 10 years, um, particularly being put through the paces, you know, that all businesses have in the last, a uh, year or two with COVID. So, um, you know, we, we, this, this model that we built is infinitely scalable. We're going to carry on doing, you know, things in the same way and, and try and grow and grow and grow and offer more services to, to the, the, you know, the market. 
Um, and of course, keeping our eye on where we can, you know, keep improving, bring on new technologies uh, and, and, and adapt as our market adapts. And ultimately what that means is keeping a very, very close eye on the market, watching what the market needs, listening to what the market needs, and being completely responsive to what the response is from the market. A very important story and a very important insight into what it looks like when you actually see the future early on and start implementing it. Thank you very much to Yuvon Wakefield. She's the chief executive officer of Caveat Legal, who even more than 10 years ago looked at the structure of the legal industry and said, we can do better. And guess what? COVID proved that model to be the right model for the way things ought to be going forward in the legal sector. Thank you very much, Yuvon. And yeah, we'll definitely speak to her again in the future to sort of figure out some of the new and emerging trends in how legal services are indeed delivered in South Africa because guess what? Lawyers can be remarkably expensive, especially when they say oops, you can't talk to me. I'm an advocate. Go find an attorney. So if there is at least a change in that practice, it is something that is definitely going to be welcomed by a whole lot of us. We're going to take a short break, take some power news headlines. Thereafter, we're going to be speaking agriculture because guess what?